Will the maid known as the Yellow Rose remain true while her beau is away soldiering for the emperor? A Hungarian Western by Morris Yokai. Today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you to all of our financial supporters. We couldn't do this without you. We really try to make your support worth your while. For a $5 monthly donation, you get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook download. Give more and you get more. It kind of cracks open the website for you so you can easily build out your classic audiobook library. And you help to give more folks like you the chance to discover the classics in a curated and easily accessible format. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com today and become a financial supporter. You'll be glad you did. Thank you so much. I'm hoping that if we get enough supporters, I can record some more classics outside of the podcast. I'm researching out an Alexandra Dumas book that might fit the bill. If you can swing it, please chip in. Well, school started, and we have two back-to-school traditions in our house. Have to do them every year. First, we have to watch American Graffiti. We talk about our favorite parts, we laugh a lot. It's a great, great show. And Scylla points out all the amazing cinematic and writing elements. This time through, she mentioned a lot about John Milner being the archetype of the king. It's interesting how every school year, a different character will be brought to the forefront, depending on what's going on with our family each year. Our second tradition is that Scylla does tarot readings for all of us at the beginning of the school year. It's a lot of fun to see her break down the cards and explain what the archetypes all mean and how they might be relevant to the coming adventures in store for us. She's really quite good. So that's what we got going on this week. And now for something completely different. A while ago, back in May, I asked via Facebook whether it might be time for a Western to be in order. Since I'm from the West myself, I thought it might be fitting. For one reason or other, I wasn't feeling it at the time. However, I did run across this idea. Today's book, The Yellow Rose, is from Morris Yokai, or Yokai Mor, as the Hungarians call him. He's one of Hungary's most famous writers. Hungary is famous for its horse culture, and this book takes place at a time before railroads and deals largely with the traditions and way of life for the cowherds and horsemen, or chikos, of Hungary. Well, I thought, what if I performed this book as if it were an American Western? It parallels our trope of Westerns so well, why not? The characters in the book aren't hearing Hungarian accents, they're hearing their own accents just from different locales. So if I'm speaking English, it would kind of be the same experience, right? Well, let's give it a shot. So let's go now to an adventure in the old world, in a western that takes place a stone's throw from Asia. And now, The Yellow Rose, part one of three, by Morris Yokai. Chapter 1 This happened when no train crossed the Hortobaj, when throughout the Alfield there was not a railway, and the water of the Hortobaj had not been regulated. The two-wheeled mill clattered gaily in the little river, and the otter lived happily among the reeds. At the first streak of dawn, a horseman, came riding across the flat Zampusta, which lies on the far side of the Hortobaj River, taking Debretsen as the center of the world. Whence did he come? Whither was he going? Impossible to guess. The Pusta has no pathway. Grass grows over hoofprint and cart track. Up to the endless horizon there is nothing but grass, not a tree, a well pole, or a hut to break the majestic green plain. The horse went its way instinctively, its rider dozing, 
nodded in the saddle, first on one side, then the other, but never let slip his foot from the stirrup. He was evidently a cowherd, for his shirt sleeves were tight at the wrists. Wide sleeves would be in the way among horned beasts. His waistcoat was blue, his jacket, with its rows of buttons, black, and so was his cloak, worked in silken flowers and hanging, loosely strapped over his shoulder. The slackly gathered reins were held in the left hand, while from the right wrist dangled a thick stock whip. A long, loaded cudgel was fastened to the horn of the saddle in front. In the wide upturned brim of his hat, he wore a single yellow rose. Once or twice the horse tossed its head, and shaking the fringed saddlecloth, woke the rider for an instant. His first movement was to his cap, to feel whether the rose was there, or if perchance it had dropped out. Then, removing the cap, he smelt the flower with keen enjoyment, although it had no rose's scent, and replacing it well to one side, threw back his head, as if he hoped in that way to catch sight of the rose. Presently, and very probably to keep himself awake, he began humming his favorite song. If only the inn were not so near. If only I did not find such cheer in golden court and copper gill. I would not linger, my love, until it ever should grow so late. But soon his head fell forward again, and he went on nodding, till all at once with a frightened start, he saw that the yellow rose was gone. Turning his horse, he commenced searching for the flower amid that sea of grass and the yellow blossoms of sinkfoil and stitchwort and water lilies. At last he found it, stuck it in his hat, and continued his song. An apple tree stands in my garden small. The blossoms it bears, they hide it all. Oh, there, where the full carnation blows, and a maiden's heart with a true love glows, is the place where I would be. And then he went to sleep again, lost the rose, and once more turned to look for it. When found this time, nestling among a cluster of pink thistle heads, he nearly kicked the plant to pieces because, because it had dared to kiss his rose. Then he sprang back to the saddle. Now, had this cowboy been superstitious, he would not have decorated his hat for the third time with the yellow rose. Had he understood bird language, he would have known what the hundreds of little larks were twittering as they rose up out of sight to greet the dawn. Wear not, wear not your yellow rose. But this Hortobaj peasant was hard-headed. He knew neither fear nor superstition. He had wasted a good deal of time, however, in seeking this rose, though possibly more in winning it, for at the watering hour he should have reached the Zam herd. By this time the overseer must be cursing him roundly. Well, let him curse. When one has a yellow rose in one's cap, one is not afraid of an overseer. The sudden neighing of his horse roused him. A horseman was approaching, whose steed, a bay with a white star, was evidently an old friend of its own. The rider was a chikosh, or horse herd, as could be seen by his wide flying sleeves, white cloak, tulip embroidered, the lasso thrown around his shoulders, and best of all, by the way he had saddled his bay, without a girth. The two herdsmen recognized one another as well as their horses, and quickening their trot, drew close together. Both men, though distinctly different, were of the true Hungarian type, such as were the first Hungarians who wandered in from Asia. The cowherd was broad-shouldered, thick-set, and bony, his face roundish and his cheeks red, while there was something of impudence in the chin, mouth, eyebrows, and little waxed mustache. His chestnut hair was cropped short and his eyes hazel, though at first sight seeming almost green. The other, the Chikosh, was strong and square-chested, yet withal slightly built, 
He had an oval face, burnt to a golden bronze, with perfectly regular clear-cut features, eyes dark and shining, and a black mustache that turned up of itself. Over his shoulders his jet-black hair fell in loose, wavy ringlets. The two horses snorted in friendly fashion, and the Chicos was the first to hail his friend. Good day, comrade. You are up early. But maybe you have not slept at all. Thanks. That's true. There was someone to send me asleep, and to wake me up. And where are you from now? Only from the Matapusta? I was at the vets. At the vets? Better kill your horse at once. Why? Then let the doctor and his old nag overtake it. He went by in his gig half an hour ago, jogging towards the Mata herd. Well, well, comrade. The shepherd's white donkey has often beaten your little bay mare. Hmm. What a pretty yellow rose you've got in your cap, comrade. Who wins one can wear one. And may he never repent it. The Chico held up his fist with a threatening gesture, till the wide sleeve slipping back disclosed a muscular sunburnt arm. Then both riders, putting spurs to their horses, went their several ways. Chapter Two The cowboy trotted towards the herd, and soon the hills of Zam, the little acacia wood, and the three tall well poles began to peep above the horizon. But it is a good ride there. Presently, he took the telltale rose from his cap, folded it in his scarlet handkerchief, and pushed it up the knotted sleeve of his coat. The horse herd, meanwhile, spurred his horse in the opposite direction, where a low-lying line of bluish mist marked the course of the Hortobaj River. He was on his way to the rose bush, where the yellow roses grew. From the whole Hortobaj, there was but one yellow rose, and that bloomed in the innkeeper's garden. Some foreigner had brought it from Belgium, they said, and its wonderful yellow flowers blossomed the whole summer through, from Whitsuntide to Advent, when there were still buds on the branches. Yellow as pure gold they were, though their scent was more like muscatel wine than roses. Many men had felt that scent rise to his head, and the girl who used to gather these roses, though not for herself, they called the yellow rose also. It was quite a mystery where the old innkeeper had picked up this maiden, for wife he had none. Some stranger had evidently forgotten her there, and the old man had kept her till she grew into a delicate, slender flower. Her cheeks were not rosy like those of other girls, but a clear, creamy color, not the tint of sickness, for the life glowed beneath, and when she smiled, seemed to dazzle and shine like a fire within. Her mouth, with its turned-up corners, was made for laughter, and suited the darkness of her eyes, eyes so dark that none could tell whether they were black or blue because if once a man looked into them, he forgot all else in the world. Her hair was black, twisted into a plate with yellow ribbon. Other girls damp their hair with quince juice to make it curly, but hers waved and curled of itself. And the songs she knew, how sweetly she could sing when she liked. If happy, she sang. If sad, she sang. For there is a song for everything. And without singing, a peasant maiden cannot live. Nothing makes the work so easy, the time pass so quickly, and the way so short. Early in the morning, when the sky was pink at sunrise, she might be heard singing as she weeded in the garden. The old innkeeper did not concern himself with business, but had given the whole management of the inn into the girl's hands. She served out the wine, cooked, did the accounts. He, meanwhile, looked after his beehives, and was busy now, for the bees were swarming. Suddenly, a horse's hoofs resounded from the yard. The dogs barked in the joyous tone with which they were wont to greet an old friend, and the old man called out, 
Clary, go in. Don't you hear the dogs barking? A customer must be here. See to him. The girl dropped her striped gown, tucked up for weeding, put on her buckled shoes, washed her hands from the watering can, and dried them with her apron, which she then threw aside, for under it she wore another very wide and clean, and with the household keys dangling from her waistband, she untied her gay-colored kerchief and smoothed her hair with her moistened palms. Then she broke off a rose from the rose bush and stuck it in her hair at one side. Picking a rose again, grumbled the old man. Maybe only for a gendarme. Why only? Why mayn't a gendarme wear a rose in his shako, as well as another fellow? Perhaps you don't think him good enough. That depends on the gendarme. But after all, it was no gendarme whom the girl found sitting at one end of the long table, but the smartest chico on the whole pusta, Shandor Dechi. Shandor! screamed the girl when she saw him, and clapping her hands, Shandor, you have come back, my darling. He was standing there, drumming on the table with the empty glasses, and only looked up to call out in a most sullen fashion, Bring wine. Shandor, cried the girl, but the lad only growled, I told you to bring wine, and let his head fall back on his hands. That is a nice good morning, after such a long absence, exclaimed the girl, at which the herdsman came somewhat to his senses, for he knew how to be polite, removing his cap and laying it on the table. Good morning, miss, he said. Phew! The girl pointed the rosy tip of her tongue at him, and shrugging her shoulders angrily, stamped off to the bar, shaking her shoes as she went. When she had brought the wine, however, she asked in an unaltered voice, Why do you call me Miss? Because you are Miss. I always was, but you never used to say so. That was another time. It was different then. Well, here is the wine anyway. Do you want anything else? Thank you, said the man. Not now. Later, perhaps. The girl responded by a clicking noise with her tongue, and then sat down near him, at the end of the long bench. The chicoche raised the bottle to his lips, drained it dry, and flung it on the floor, where it smashed into a thousand fragments. Why have you broken the bottle? she asked softly that no one else may drink out of it. Next he tossed three ten-kreutzer notes on the table, dog tongues, the country people call them, two being for the red wine, one for the bottle. The girl, meanwhile, had seized a broom and was diligently sweeping up the broken glass. Then, knowing the rule, she dived behind the wooden lattice railing off the bar and brought out a fresh bottle. How she longed to look in his eyes, but he, evidently guessing it, pulled his hat lower over his face than before. Finally, she did manage to get possession of his cap, and then tried to transfer the yellow rose in her hair to the silk ribbon decorating its brim. But the herdsman saw and snatched it out of her hands. Keep your roses for some worthier person, he said shortly. Shandor, began the girl at last, do you wish to make me cry? That would be false, as your words are false. Did not Ferko Latza leave you this morning with one of your roses in his cap? She did not turn red at this, only so much the paler. God knows, I... But a hand laid across her mouth stopped all further speech. Do not take God's name in vain, cried the herdsman. And how did those golden earrings get into your ears, I wonder? You donkey! Clary laughed outright. You gave them to me yourself, only I had them gilded by the jeweler in Uivarosh. Then the Chikosh caught hold of both her hands and spoke his mind slowly and earnestly. Dearest Clary, he said, I won't call you Miss any more. I beg you from the bottom of my heart not to lie to me. Nothing is so detestable as lying. 
They say lying dog, though dogs never lie. For a dog has a different bark when he smells a thief round the farm, or scents danger, or hears his master coming, and his bark never misleads. A dog is honest enough. It is men who know how to lie, and theirs is the true yelping. As for me, it never came into my mind to lie. My tongue is not fashioned that way. Lying ill suits a mustache, and it's a bad business when bearded lips speak lying words like a coward who fears a beating. Now, see, when the conscription was here last autumn, they summoned us all from the pusta, for the townspeople wanted to keep us, for without herdsmen, the cattle and horses would fare badly. So first they took care to cross the palms of the committee with silver, and then the doctors whispered to us what sort of bodily defect we could feign, so as to be discharged as unfit. Fercolazza took to the trick. He swore he was as deaf as a doorpost, could not hear a trumpet even, he, who had such good ears that if a beast lows in the blackest midnight, he can tell whether it is a stray one wandered into the herd or a cow calling her last calf. My eyes nearly fell out of my head. Hey, he knew how to lie, the scoundrel. When my turn came to be inspected, they made out that my heart beat irregularly. Well, if it beats irregularly, said I, it is not my heart that's in fault, but the yellow rose yonder at the Hortobaj Inn. The gentlemen all nudged me to trust to the doctor, who said I had enlargement of the heart. Why, it's just big enough to hold one little bit of a girl, and nothing else. There is nothing in the world the matter with me. So they took me for a soldier, but respected me. They never even cut my hair, but sent me to be soldier Chikosh to the military stud at Mezuhejesh. And before half a year was over, the town council put down the thousand florins ransom to buy me off and send me back to the horses again. But I will work out those thousand florins with my two hands, though not with a lying tongue. That is another matter. The girl attempted to get her hands free and to turn off the affair as a joke. My word, Shandor, did you learn to preach when you were eating the emperor's bread? Really, you're so eloquent, you ought to go as probationer every Sunday to Balmazui Varosh. Now, now, do not jest, said the man. I know what is in your little head. You are thinking that maids are but a feeble folk, and have no other weapon but lying, otherwise they would be overmatched. The swift feet for the hare, the wings for the bird, and for the girl, her lying lips. But, sweetheart, I am a man who has never hurt the weaker. The hare can bide in the cover, and the bird on her nest for me. I would never disturb them. Neither would I harm the girl who speaks the truth with as much as a hard word or a look. But if you lie to me, why then I must judge you as hardly as if those pretty cheeks of yours were smeared with Vienna rouge. Look at the rose in your hand. It is hardly opened. But if I blow on it with my hot breath, one after another, all the petals will unfold. Be such a rose then, my darling, and open your heart and your soul to me. I will not be angry, whatever you confess, and I will forgive you even if it breaks my heart. And then, what will you give me? As much of it as you have left me, said the man. The girl, knowing the herdsman's custom of eating bacon, paprika, the red pepper, and white bread with their morning wine, rose and set this before him, and was glad to see it was not scorned. Indeed, the chikosh, drawing out his long knife with its inlaid handle from his top boot, cut off a slice of bread and bacon and fell to work heartily. Meanwhile, through the open door, appeared the watchdog, wagging his tail, and going to the herdsman, he rubbed his nose against his legs and then lay down near him, yawning with great affability. Even Baudry knows you, said the girl, 
Yes. Dogs are faithful. It's only girls who forget. Shandor, Shandor, she cried. What a pity it was you could not tell that one little lie when it was so needful. Then they would not have taken you as a soldier to Mezuhejesh. It is not wise to leave a girl to herself. It is not wise to let a lilac bush and blossom overhang the paling, because then every passerby who chooses can break off a piece. At these words the very morsel of bread fell from the herdsman's mouth, and he cast it to the dog. Is this truth that you are saying? Truth? Don't you know the song about when the girl's out in the storm under his cloak, the boy keeps her warm? Yes, and how it goes on, too. The maid keeps near to the lad in the showers, his cloak being worked with silken flowers. Get away, dog. You and you only wag your tail when there is a question of bacon. Just then the horse in the yard outside began to neigh, and the girl went out, reappearing in a few minutes. Where have you been? asked the man. Tying up your horse in the stable. Who bid you tie him up? I always did so till now. Now it is different. I am off directly. What? You won't take a bite? Isn't bread and bacon good enough? Maybe you got better from the emperor. But stop, I can bring you something nicer. She went to the cupboard in the wall and brought out a plate of fried fowl, or back hendley. For fowl, fried in bread crumbs and then left cold, was a favorite tidbit of the herdsman's. Whose remains are these? he demanded suspiciously. Well, first, think a little. All sorts of people come to an inn, and anyone who pays can have back Hendley. Then you had grand folks here last night? Certainly, said the girl. Two gentlemen from Vienna and two from Debrecen. They stayed up till two o'clock and then went on. If you don't believe me, I can show you their names in the guest book. Oh, I believe you. The great tabby Tom, who had been washing his face by the stove, rose at this moment, stretched himself, arched his back, jumped down, and going to the chikosh, measured his claws on his boots, showing how high the snow would lie next winter. Then he sprang into his friend's arms, rubbing and pushing his head against his hand, and slowly licking every one of the five fingers. At last, he lay down and began purring. Look how the cat is trying to coax you, said Clary. I am not going to ask him whose arms he purred in yesterday. How much do I pay for the back handling? You? Nothing, of course. Somebody else did that. But where are you off to in such a terrible hurry? To the vet, on the Matapusta. I am taking him a letter. You won't find him at home, for he passed here at three this morning, looking for those gentlemen. When he heard they had gone, he went jogging on in his gig to the Zampusta. One gentleman was the steward of a Moravian count, who wants to buy some of our cattle to breed on his estate. The other German was an artist. He drew me in his little book, and the cowherd also. So the cowherd was here also? Of course he was here, since he was sent to show the gentleman across the Pusta to the Zam herd. Only it seems funny to me, remarked the Chikosh, that the cowboy left an hour later than the gentleman he was meant to guide. Dear me, you can cross-examine like the district judge. Well, he came to bid me goodbye. He is going far away, and we will never see him any more. As if to prove the truth of her words, a real shining tear dropped from the girl's eyes, though she tried her best to hide it. Not that the Chikosh minded that, for it was an honest tear at any rate, and he preferred to turn his head aside when she dried her eyes with her apron. Then he stuck his short clay pipe in his mouth. A pipe in the mouth signifies no kisses. And what takes the cowboy so far away? he inquired. He is going to Moravia as head herdsman to the cattle which they are buying at Zam. He is to get a stone house, so much corn, and six hundred florins his wages. He'll be quite the gentleman, and they will respect him there, because only a Hungarian herdsman can manage a Hungarian herd. And you? 
Aren't you going to Moravia as head herdsman's wife? You rascal, said the girl. You know I'm not. You know quite well I love no one but you. I might, if I weren't chained fast to you and to this pusta. Why, I am your slave. Not exactly, said the man. You know it is not like that. But whoever you have bewitched with those eyes of yours must come back from the ends of the earth to you. You give him a charmed drink that compels him to think of you. Or you sew one of your hairs in his shirt sleeve that you may draw him back, even from beyond the stars. It's just the same with me. Since I looked into your eyes, I have been made a fool of. And have I not been fool enough? She asked. Haven't I often wondered what would become of me? Whom did I ask to melt lead with me on Christmas Eve? Whose kerchief did I wear, though we never said it was a betrothal gift? Did I ever go spying after you when you danced with other girls and giddy young wives at Uivaros Fair? If only you had not put the rose in his cap. Well, give me yours, and here is a match to it, which is easily stuck in. No, said the lad. I want that rose which you gave to the cowherd, and I will never rest till I have it in my hands. At that the girl clasped her hands imploringly. Shandor, Shandor, don't talk like that. You two must not fight about me. About a yellow rose? It must be. Either he kills me or I him. But one of us must fall. And that is what you call telling the truth? cried the girl. You, who have just promised not to be angry with me any more? With you, yes. A girl can't help forgetting, but a man should bear in mind. God knows, I never forgot you. Perhaps not. Like in the song, Whom e'er within my arms I pressed, Yet in my heart I loved thee best. No, dearest. I am not a hard man, And I did not come to quarrel with you, But only to show you that I am alive, And not dead. Though I know how happy you would be if I were. Shandor, then you want me to go and buy matches? Matches, is it? said the man. That's the way with you girls. If you fall into the ditch, then it's three boxes of matches from the Jew, a cup of hot coffee, and it is all over. But surely the wiser plan would be to avoid the ditches altogether. Don't speak about it. Do you remember, the girl asked, how, when we first met, we were playing that game? I fell into the well. Who pulled you out? Shandor Dechi. And you did pull me out. But if I had thought it was for someone else. I ho, sighed the herdsman. That was long ago, before ever the Dorojma mill was sung about. Is that something new? The girl stooped over the bench closer to the lad. Sing it first, and then I will learn it. So Shandor Dechi set his back against the wall, put one hand to his cap and the other on the table, and commenced the tune, the sad air suiting the sadness of his words. Dorojma's mill, Dorojma's mill, the wind has dropped, tis standing still. Ah, faithless thou hast flown, my dove, another claims thy life, thy love. This is the reason, if you will, why it turns no more Dorojma's mill. Such a song it was, as is born on the plains and blown hither and thither, like the thistle-down scattered by the wind. The girl tried the air after him, and where she failed, the chikosh helped her. And so it went on till they both knew it, and sang it together perfectly. And then at the finish they kissed each other. This was the end of the song. But hardly had Clary sung the last note, before Shandor Dechi had stuck the short clay pipe in his mouth again. There you go, putting that horrid pipe in your mouth, she exclaimed sulkily. Well, it matches me. I'm horrid too, said the lad. You are just a horrid rascal. A lad like you is good for nothing else but to be turned into a distaff and stuck up behind the door. So saying, she gave him a shove with her elbow. 
Now, what are you coming around me for? He asked. I? Coming round you? Do I want you? If lands like you were sold by the dozen, never a one would I buy. I was blind and cracked for sure to have loved you. Why, I could have ten such lads as you for every one of my ten fingers. She stormed in so genuine a manner that at last even Baudry was deceived, and believing that his mistress was offended with this horrid man, jumped up and began growling at him. It made the girl laugh heartily, but the Chicoche neither caught her merriment nor saw any cause for laughter. He just sat there, moody and silent, holding his pipe between his teeth. The pipe was not alight, for indeed it was empty. Then the girl tried teasing him. Well, dear, you are quite aware of your own good looks, she said. You wouldn't laugh for the world, would you? Why, it would squeeze up your two black eyes and make your two red lips quite crooked, and all your beauty would be spoiled. Debert's in town does not pay me for being beautiful. But I do. Wasn't my payment big enough for you? It was. There was even enough for another person left over. Are you beginning again? All about that one yellow rose? Are you so jealous of your comrade then? Your own close companion? How could he help himself, poor fellow? If a gallant of the town feels his heart aching for a rose, why, he has the whole flower garden to choose from, full of all sorts and shades of roses, red, pink, yellow, and cream. But how does the song go? Only the peasant maid can still the peasant's heart in good and ill. So, you take his part. Well, whose fault is it? The girl's, who sings, and he knew he could, and he knew it still he would. Or the man's who listens and understands. Do you take the blame, then? You said you would forgive me everything. I will keep my word. And love me again? Later. Ah, it's a big word, that later, said the girl. I love you now, as you have shown me. The Chicoche rose from the table, stuck the short pipe into the wide brim of his hat, and going to the girl, put his arms round her, gazing as he spoke into her large, dark eyes. My darling, you know there are two kinds of fever, the hot and the cold. The hot is more violent, but the cold lasts longer. The one passes quickly. The other returns again and again. But I will just speak plainly and not mince matters. Mine was the fault. For if I had not breathed on my yellow rosebud, it would not have opened, and others would not have found out the sweet scent which has brought all the wasps and moths. I do love you indeed, but differently now with the constancy of the cold sort of fever. I will deal as truly by you as thine own mother, and as soon as I am made head herdsman, we will go to the priest and live faithfully together ever afterwards. But if I find anyone else fluttering around, then God help me, for were he my father's own son, I will crack his head for him. Here's my hand on it. He stretched out his hand to the girl, and she, in answer, pulled out her golden earrings, placing them in his open palm. But, dearest, wear them, he insisted, if, as you say, they are my silver ones gilded, and I must believe you. So she put them back in her ears, and in so doing, she put something back in her heart that had lain hidden there till now. Somehow this sort of love, likened to the shivering stage of fever, was not altogether to her taste. She understood the burning fit better. Next, the girl, after reflecting, slipped the cloak from the herdsman's neck and hung it up behind the lattice of the bar, as she was accustomed to take the coats of customers in pledge who could not pay their reckoning. Don't hurry, she said. There is time. The vet can't possibly be back at the Mata farm before noon, because he must examine all the cattle that are sold and write a certificate for each. You will only find his old housekeeper, and here you are safe and dry, 
neither the storm can drench you nor your sweetheart's tears. Look how glad your last words have made me. They will be in my head all day long. And see how far away I thought of those last words, since I have brought you a present. It is in my cloak sleeve yonder. Go and fetch it out. Many things were in that sleeve, steel, flint, and tinder, tobacco pouch, money bag, and among it all, the girl discovered a new packet, done up in silver paper. When it was unfolded, and she beheld a comb of yellow tortoise shell, her face beamed with happiness. This is for me? Whom else? Now, when a peasant maid twists her plate of hair round a comb, it means she is betrothed, has a lover of her own, and is ours no longer. Nor can she any more sing the song about I know not whose darling am I. Standing before the mirror, Clary did up her hair in a knot round the comb, and then she looked prettier than ever. Now you shall kiss me, she said. She offered the kiss herself, in fact, stretching out her arms, but the man held her back. Not yet, he said. I will be hot presently, but I am still shivering. It was a rebuff and the girl drew her brows together, for she felt shamed, and besides, something burned in her heart. However, she only tried harder to be loving and gentle, love and anger meanwhile striving madly together in her heart, anger just because of the love. Shall I sing your favorite song? she asked, while the fish is roasting, if you like. She went to the fireplace, took a fish out of a big barrel full of the hortobaj fish, called karas, slashed it with a kitchen knife on both sides, sprinkled it well with salt and pepper, and sticking a skewer through it, placed it beside the red-hot embers. Then she sang in her sweet, clear voice, O oh, good dame of the pusta inn, bake me fish, bring lemon and wine, set your wench on the watch without, Bid her tell what she sees in time. The song had a fascination of its own, bringing visions of the endless pusta, with the mirage overhanging its horizon, and echoes, too, of the lone shepherd's pipe and the sad-sounding horn of the herdsman. Besides, is not the whole romance of the betyars, the pusta robbers, life, contained in the words, Set your wench on the watch without. Bid her tell what she sees in time. As soon as the fish was browned enough, the girl brought it to the chikosh. Never is this dish eaten otherwise than by holding the end of the spit in the fingers and picking off the fish with a pocket knife. It tastes best like that, and a girl cannot show her love for her sweetheart more distinctly than by roasting him a fish on the spit. Then what a delight it is to watch him enjoying the work of her hands. Meanwhile, Clary went on singing. Nine gendarmes and their weapons flash, cries the girl in her frightened haste. But the betyar gallops his swift bay steed where the mirage plays o'er the boundless waste. Once, when they sang this together, at the line, Gallops his swift bay steed, the herdsman would throw up his cap to the rafters and bring down his fist with a crash on the table. But now he did not heed it. Don't you care for the song nowadays? asked the girl. Even that doesn't please you. Why should it? I'm no betyar, and have nothing to do with thieves. Gendarmes are honest men and do their duty. As for a good-for-nothing betyar, he sets a girl to watch outside and as soon as he sees so much as the tip of a gendarme's helmet, he is off and away, or the boundless waste, leaving fish and wine and all behind him, and he shouts it out in his own praise, too, the cowardly thief. Well, you have changed since you ate the emperor's bread. I've not changed, but the times. You'd turn a coat inside out if you like. After all, it is only a coat. A bunda, fur-lined cloak, is always a bunda. 
And do you know, said the girl, the greatest insult a man can pay his sweetheart is to quote a worn-out old saw like that. But if I know none better, perhaps the gentlemen from Moravia, who were here last night, had newer jokes to amuse you with. Better jokes, said the girl. Anyway, they didn't sit here looking like stuck pigs. The painter especially was a very proper young fellow. If he had only been a hair's breadth taller, as it was, he just came up to my chin. Did you measure yourselves then? Rather. I taught him to dance chardash, and he jumped about like a two-months-old kid on the barn floor. And the cowherd? asked the man. Did he see you dancing with the German artist, and yet not wring his neck? Wring his neck? Why, they drank eternal friendship together. Well, it is not my business. Give me some more wine, but better stuff than this vinegar. I shall have to come out with another old saying. The fish is unhappy in the third water, for the third water should be wine. That's a double insult to call my wine water. Never mind, said the herdsman. Just get me a sealed bottle. Now it was the undoing of Shandor Detchi that he asked for a sealed bottle, one brought from the town, sealed with green wax, with a pink or blue label pasted on one side, covered with golden letters. Such wine is only fit for gentlefolk, or perhaps for people in the emperor's pay. Clary's heart beat loud and fast as she went into the cellar to fetch a bottle of this gentlefolk's wine. For suddenly, the girl remembered about a gypsy woman, who had once told her fortune for some old clothes, and out of pure gratitude had said this to her as well. Should your lover's heart grow cold, my dear, and you wish to make it flame again, that is easily managed. Give him wine mixed with lemon juice, and drop a bit of this root called fat mannequin into it. Then his love will blaze up again, till he would break down walls to reach you. It flashed across the girl's mind that now was the very moment to test the charm, and the roots, stumpy and black, like little round-headed, fat-legged mannequins, were lying safe in a drawer of her chest. In the olden days much was believed of this magic plant, how it shrieked when pulled from the ground, and that those who heard it died, how at last they took dogs to uproot it, tying them to it by the tail, how Circe bewitched Ulysses and his comrades with it. The chemist, who has another use for it, calls it Atropa Mandragora. But how could the girl know that it was poisonous? Chapter 3 Early, ere the dawn, the strangers at the Hortobaj Inn started on their way. This inn, though only a charda, or wayside house of call, was no owl-haunted, tumble-down, reed-thatched place, such as the painter had imagined, but a respectable brick building, with a shingle roof, comfortable rooms, and a capital kitchen and cellar quite worthy of any town. Below the flower garden, the Hortobaj River wound silently along, between banks fringed with reeds and willows. Not far from the inn, the high road crossed it on a substantial stone bridge of nine arches. Debretzin folk maintain that the solidity of this bridge is due to the masons having used milk to slake their lime. Jealous people say that they employed wine made from Hortobaj grapes, and that this drew it together. The object of the early start was aesthetic as well as practical. The painter looked forward to seeing a sunrise on the Pusta, a sight which no one, who has not viewed it with his own eyes, can form the slightest idea of. The practical reason was that the cattle to be sold could only be separated from the herd in the early morning. In spring, most of them have little calves, and at dawn, when these are not sucking, the herdsmen, going in among the herd, catch those whose mothers have been selected and take them away. The mothers then follow of their own accord. 
a stranger would be gored to death by these wild creatures, who have never seen anyone but their own drovers, but to them they are quite accustomed. So the strangers set off for those wild parts of the plain, where even the Pusta dwellers need a guide, in a couple of light carriages. The two coachmen, however, knew the district, and needed no pilot. They therefore left the cowboy, who had been sent as a guide, to amuse himself at the inn, he promising to overtake them before they reached the herd. The artist was a famous landscape painter from Vienna, who often came to Hungary for the sake of his work, and who spoke the tongue of the people. The other Viennese was manager of the stables to the Moravian landowner, Count Engelshort. It would perhaps have been wiser to have sent some farmer who knew about cattle, for a lover of horses has little mind left for anything else. But he had this advantage over the rest of the staff, that he knew Hungarian. For when a lieutenant of dragoons, he had been long stationed in Hungary, where the fair ladies had taught him to speak it. Two of the Count's drovers had been told off to escort him, strong, sturdy fellows, each armed with a revolver. As for the gentleman from Debrecen, one was the chief constable, the other the worthy citizen from whose herd the twenty-four stock cows and their bull were to be selected. Now at the time of starting, the waning moon and the brightest of the stars were still visible, while over in the east dawn was already breaking. The townsman, a typical Magyar, explained to the painter how the star above them was called the Wanderer's Lamp, and how the poor lads, or Betyars, looking up at it would sigh, God help us, and so escape detection when stealing cattle. This quite enchanted the painter. What a Shakespearean idea, he said. He grew more and more impressed with the endless vision of Pusta. When, an hour later, their galloping steeds brought them where nothing could be seen save sky above and grass below, where there was not a bird or frog-eating stork to relieve the marvelous monotony. What tones, what tints, what harmony in the contrasts? It's all well enough, said the farmer, till the mosquitoes and the horseflies come, and that fresh, velvety turf against those dark pools. Those puddles there, Tochigo as we call them. Meanwhile, high above sounded the sweet song of the lark. Ah, those larks, how wonderful, how splendid. They're thin enough now, but wait until the wheat ripens, replied the farmer. Slowly the light grew. The purple of the sky melted into gold. The morning star, herald of the sun, already twinkled above the now visible horizon, and a rainbow-like iridescence played over the dewy grass, keeping pace with the movements of the dark figures. The horses, four to each carriage, flew over the pathless green meadowland, till, presently, something began to show dark on the horizon. A plantation, the first acacias on the hitherto treeless pusta, and some bluish knolls. Those are the Tartar hills of Zam, explained the Debretson farmer to his companions. There stood some village destroyed by the Tartars, the ruins of the church still peep out of the grass, and the dogs, when they dig holes, scrape out human bones. And there, what sort of a Golgotha is that? That, said the farmer, is no Golgotha, but the three poles of the cattle wells. We are close to the herd. They halted at the acacias, and there agreed to await the doctor who was to come jogging along from the Matapusta, in his one-horse trap. Meanwhile, the painter made notes in his sketchbook, falling from ecstasy to ecstasy. What subjects? What motives? In vain his companions urged him to draw a fine solitary acacia, rather than a group of nasty old thistles. At last appeared the doctor and his gig, coming up from a slanting direction. But he did not stop, only shouted, Good morning! from the box, and then, Hurry, hurry, before the daylight comes. So after a long enough drive, they reached the great herd. This is the pride of the Hortobaj Pusta. One thousand five hundred cattle 
all in one mass. Now all lay silent, but whether sleeping or not, who could tell? No one has ever seen cattle with closed eyes and heads resting on the ground, and to them Hamlet's soliloquy, to sleep, perchance to dream, in no wise applies. What a picture, cried the painter, enchanted. A forest of uplifted horns, and there in the middle the old bull himself, with his sooty head and his wrinkled neck, the jet-black litter surrounded by green pasture, the grey mist in the background, and far away the light of a shepherd's fire. This must be perpetuated. Thereupon he sprang from the carriage, saying, Please follow the others. I see the shelter, and will meet you there. So, taking his paint-box and camp-stool, and laying his sketch-book on his knees, he began rapidly jotting down the scene, while the carriage with the farmer drove on. All at once, the two watchdogs of the herd, observing this strange figure on the pusta, rushed towards him, barking loudly. It was, however, not the painter's way to be frightened. The dogs, moreover, with their white coats and black noses, fell into the scheme of color. Nor did they attack the man, peacefully squatting there, but when quite close to him, stood still. What could he be? Sitting down, they poked out their heads inquisitively at the sketchbook. What was this? The painter pursued the joke, for he daubed the cheek of the one with green and the other with pink, and these attentions they seemed to find flattering. But when they by and by saw each other's pink or green face, they fancied it was that of a strange dog and took to fighting. Luckily, the taligash, or wheelbarrow boy, came up at that moment. The taligash is the youngest boy on the place, and his duty is to follow the cattle with his wheelbarrow and scrape up the poor man's peat, which they leave on the meadow. This serves as fuel on the pusta, and its smoke is alike grateful to the nose of man and beast. The taligash rushed his barrow between the fighting dogs, separated and pursued them, shouting, Get away there! For the pusta watchdog does not fear the stick, but of the wheelbarrow he is in terror. The taligash was a very smart little lad, in his blue shirt and linen breeches, worked with scarlet. He delivered the message entrusted to him by the gentleman very clearly. It was that the painter should join them at the shelter where there was much to sketch. But the striking picture of the herd was not yet completed. Can you run me along in your barrow? asked the painter. For this silver piece? Oh, sir, said the lad. I've wheeled much a heavier calf than you. Please step in, sir. So utilizing this clever idea, the painter gained both his ends. He got to the karam seated in the barrow and managed to finish his characteristic sketch by the way. Meanwhile, the others had left their carriages and were introducing the Vienna cattle buyer to the herdsman in charge. This man was an exceptionally fine example of the Hungarian pusta dweller. A tall, strong fellow, with hair beginning to turn gray, and a curled and waxed mustache. His face was bronzed from exposure to hard weather, and his eyebrows drawn together from constant gazing into the sun. By karam is understood on the pusta that whole arrangement which serves as shelter against wind and storm for both man and beast. Wind is the great enemy. Rain, heat, and cold the herdsman ignores. He turns his fur-lined cloak inside out, pulls down his cap, and faces it. But against wind he needs protection, for wind is a great power on the plains. Should the whirlwind catch the herd on the pastures, it will unless there be some wood to check them, drive them straight to the teis. So the shelter is formed of a planking of thick boards, with three extended wings into the corners of which the cattle can withdraw. The herdsman's dwelling is a little hut, its walls plastered like a swallow's nest. It is not meant for sleeping in, there is not room enough, but is only a place where the men keep their furs and their bank. This is just a small calfskin with the feet left on, and a lock in place of the head. It holds their tobacco, red pepper, even their papers. Round the walls hang their cloaks, the embroidered sur 
for summer, for winter, the fur-lined bunda. These are the herdsman's coverings, and in them he sleeps beneath God's sky. Only the overseer reposes under the projecting eaves, on a wooden bench for bedstead, above his head, the shelf with the big round loaves, and the tub that holds the week's provisions. His wife, who lives in the town, brings them every Sunday afternoon. Before the hut stands a small circular erection woven out of reeds, with a brick-paved flooring and no roof. This is the kitchen, the vashalo, and here the herdsman's stew, guyashhush, and meal porridge are cooked in a big pot hung on a forked stick. The taligash does the cooking. A row of long-handled tin spoons are stuck in the reed wall. But where did the gentleman leave the cowboy? asked the overseer. He had some small account to settle with the innkeeper's daughter, answered the farmer. His name was Shaigato. Well, if he comes home drunk, the betyar. Betyar, interrupted the painter, delighted at hearing the word. Is our cowboy a betyar? I only use the expression as a compliment, the overseer explained. Ah, sighed the painter. I should so like to see a real betyar to put him in my sketchbook. Well, the gentleman won't find one here, and we don't care for thieves. If one comes roaming around, we soon kick him out. So there are no betyars left on the Hortobaj Pusta? There's no saying. Certainly there are plenty of thieves among the shepherds, and some of the swineherds turn brigands, and it does sometimes happen that when a chikosh gets silly and loses his head, he sinks to a vagabond betyar. But no one can ever remember a cowboy having taken to robbery. How is that? Because the cowboy works among quiet, sensible beasts. He never sits drinking with shepherds and swineherds. Then the cowherd is the aristocrat of the pusta, remarked the manager of the stables. That's it exactly. Just as counts and barons are among grand folk, so are chikosh and cowboys among the other herdsmen. So there is no equality on the pusta? As long as men are on the earth... There will never be equality, said the overseer. He who is born a gentleman will remain one, even in a peasant's coat. He will never steal his neighbor's cow or horse, even if he find it straying, but will drive it back to its owner. But whether he won't try a little cheating at the market, that I am not prepared to say. For gentlemen to take in each other at the horse fair is, however, quite an aristocratic custom. Still more so at the cattle market so I would recommend you to use your eyeglass when you are with us, for when you have driven off your cattle, I am no longer responsible. Thanks for the warning, said the manager. Here the doctor interrupted the discussion. Come out, gentlemen, he cried, in front of the kitchen, and see the sunrise. The painter rushed forward and began to sketch, but soon fell into utter despair. Why, this is absurd. What color! Dark blue ground, violet mist on the horizon, above it, orange sky, and over that a long streak of rosy cloud. What! A purple glory announces the coming of the sun. A glowing fire is rising above the sharply defined horizon, just like a burning pyramid, now like red-hot iron, yet not so dazzling that one cannot look at it with the naked eye. Now look, do! The sun is five-sided. The upper part grows egg-shaped. The lower contracts. The top flattens out. Now it is quite like a mushroom. No, no, a Roman urn. This is absurd. It can't be painted. Now there comes a thin cloud which turns it into a blindfolded cupid or a bearded deputy. No, if I painted the sun five-sided and with a mustache, they would shut me up in an asylum. The painter threw down his brushes. These Hungarians, he said, must always have something out of the common. Here they are giving us a sunrise which is a reality, but at the same time an impossibility. That is not as it should be. The doctor began to explain that this was only an optical delusion, like the Fata Morgana, and was due to the refraction of the rays through the differently heated strata of the atmosphere. 
"'All the same it is impossible,' said the painter. "'Why, I can't believe what I see!' But the sun did not leave him in wonder much longer. Hitherto, the whole display had been but a dazzling effect of mirage, and when the real orb rose with floods of light, the human eye could no longer gaze at it with impunity. Then the rosy heavens suddenly brightened into gold, and the line of the horizon appeared to melt into the sky. At the first flash of sunlight, the whole sleeping camp stirred. The forest of horns of fifteen hundred cattle moved. The old bull shook the bell at his neck, and at its sound uprose the pusta chorus. One thousand five hundred cattle began to low. Splendid! Good Lord! exclaimed the painter ecstatically. This is a Wagner chorus. Oboes, hunting horns, kettle drums. What an overture! What a scene! It is a finale from the Götter Dammerung. Yes, yes, said Mr. Scheigato. But now they are going to the well. Every cow is calling her calf. That is why they are lowing. Three herdsmen ran to the well, the beam of which testified to the skill of the carpenter, and setting the three buckets in motion, emptied the water into the large drinking trough. Fatiguing work, which has to be done three times a day. Would it not be simpler to use some mechanism worked by horsepower? inquired the German gentleman of the overseer. We have such a machine, he replied. But the cowboy would rather wear out his own hands than frighten his horse with it. Meanwhile, a fourth cowboy had been occupied in picking out those cows which belonged to Mr. Shigato, and in removing their calves, which he drove into the corral, the mothers following them meekly into the fenced enclosure. These are mine, said Mr. Shigato. But how can the herdsman tell among a thousand cattle which belong to Mr. Shigato? asked the manager of the stables. How do you know one from the other? The overseer cast a compassionate glance over his shoulder at the questioner. Has the gentleman ever seen two cows just alike? To my eyes they are all alike, but not to the herdsman's, said the overseer. The manager, however, professed himself perfectly satisfied with the selected cattle. The barrow boy now came up and announced that from the lookout tree he had seen the other cowherd coming up at a gallop. Running his horse, growled the overseer. Just let him show his face here. I'll thrash him till he forgets you in his own name. But you won't really strike him? No. For whoever beats a cowherd will have to kill him before he cures him in that way. And he's my favorite lad, too. Brought him up and christened him. He is my godson, the rascal. Yet you part with him. He is taking the herd to Moravia. Yes, said the overseer. Just because I have a leaning towards the boy. I don't like the way he is going on. Head over ears in love with that pale-faced girl at the Hortobagi Inn. It is a bad business. That girl has a sweetheart already. A chicoche who is away soldiering. And if he comes home on leave and the lads meet, it will be like two angry bulls who mean business. Much better that he should go away and take some pretty little Annie up there and forget all about his yellow rose. In the meantime, the veterinary had examined every beast separately and had made out a certificate for each. Then the Taligash marked the buyer's initials in vermilion on their hides, for all the herdsmen can ride. The clattering hoofs of the horse which carried the cowboy could now be heard. His sleepiness had vanished with the sharp ride, and the morning air had cleared his head. He sprang smartly from the saddle, at some distance from the corral, and came up leading his horse by the bridle. You rag-tag and bobtail, called out the overseer from the front of the enclosure. Where the devil have you been? Not a word, said the lad, but slipped the saddle and bridle off his horse. It was white with foam, and taking a corner of his coat, he rubbed its chest, wiped it down, and fastened on the halter. Where were you, by Pontius Pilate's copper angel? Coming an hour behind the gentry you should have brought with you, eh, scoundrel? Still the lad was silent. 
fiddled with the horse and hung saddle and bridle on the rack. The overseer's face grew purple. He screamed the louder, Will you answer me, or shall I have to bore a hole in your ears? Then the cowboy spoke. You know, master, that I am deaf and dumb. Damn the day you were born, cried the overseer. Do you think I invented that story that you should mock me? Don't you see the sun is up? Well, is it my fault that the sun is up? The others began to laugh, while the overseer's wrath increased. Take care, you blackguard. Better not attempt to trifle with me, for if I once lay hands on you, I'll mangle you like unbleached linen. I'll be there too, you bet. Indeed you won't, rascal, exclaimed the overseer, who himself could not help laughing. There, talk to him in German, any of you who can. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of The Yellow Rose, Part 1 of 3 by Morris Yokai. If you have enjoyed this book, please visit our website at classictalesaudiobooks.com and sign up to be a financial supporter. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook. You'll be glad you did. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>